Okay, I think we'll go and get started here. Um, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Trans Am, a digital performance festival. Um, I'm going to go over these webinar tips real quick. Um, the chat is disabled. So if you have any questions, please put it in the Q&A box and we'll go over that later. Um, today's session is being recorded. So if you have any technical difficulties or have to leave, you can, you can always view this later on and you'll be getting an email with the link whenever it's available online. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Dr. Beth Cattleman, Curator of the Theater Research Institute at OSU. Thank you, Ian. Hey everyone, I'm Beth Cattleman, Curator of the Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee Theater Research Institute. Welcome to the first day of the Trans And Digital Performance Festival. We have two great panels for you today, but before I turn the program over to our panelists, I'd like to take a brief moment to share with you some of the wonderful LGBTQ collections and materials that we have at the Theater Research Institute. Well, Ian, can you put up the, um, can you get the slides to sure advance? Can. Yeah, just uh, let me know when. Go ahead and go to the next slide, please. Are we set? Yes. Okay. So I need to, I'm not, my not, I'm not sharing anymore. Correct? Perfect. Correct. All right. Um, so uh, we have many LGBTQ plus related materials uh, at the Theater Research Institute. Um, next slide, please. For instance, a performing gender collection contains postcards, sheet music, and other ephemera on a variety of theater performances related to gender, including transgender performers, cross-dressing on stage, including historic pants roles, and male and female impersonators, and other performances that foreground gender in all its forms. This is a script of the musical Hedwig and the Angry Inch. Next slide, please. The Cockettes were a gender-bending performance group formed in the fall of 1969 in San Francisco. The group disbanded in 1972, and here are original posters from two of their productions. Next slide, please. This is a cover and one of the photos from the book, Rose is a Rose is a Rose, Gender Performance in Photography by Jennifer Blessing. It was based on a 1997 Guggenheim Museum exhibition. The book includes portraits, self-portraits, and photo montages that foreground gender. Next slide. Here is a postcard publicizing Nicholas Shannon Savard's one-person show at the Indie Fringe Festival. And we are very fortunate to have Nicholas Shannon as the coordinator and moderator of our event today. Next slide. Julian L. Tinge was a well-known female impersonator of the early 1900s. He appeared in vaudeville and toured Europe and the United States. For a time, he performed using only the name L. Tinge, which served to hide his gender. Next slide, please. Vesta Tilly and Florence Tempest, featured on the sheet music you see here, were both well-known male impersonators who performed in vaudeville and music hall in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Here are two cabinet cards from the Charles H. McKay collection of exotic dance from burlesque to clubs. Cabinet cards typically measured four and a quarter inches and to six and a half inches, and they became very popular in the 1880s. The two women here are performing male roles and showing their legs in tights, very risque for the time period. The McKay collection is one of the biggest collections of materials related to burlesque in the United States. Tom Ian was a playwright and lyricist best known for writing the lyrics for the musical Dream Girls, a show for which he won a Tony in 1981. 
Prior to that, he had a long career off-Broadway in the 1960s and 70s. One of Ian's friends and favorite collaborators was Harris Glenn Milstead, better known by his stage name, Divine. The Tom Ian collection contains thousands of pieces of ephemera related to Ian's long career, including programs, posters, Polaroid photos, production notes, and scrapbooks. So those are just a few of the items that we have at the Theater Research Institute. And if you would like more information about these and other resources at the Lawrence and Lee Research Institute, please contact myself, Beth Cattleman, and you can see my email address there, or you can contact my colleague, Mara Frazier, who is our curator of dance, and there is her email. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn this over to Nicholas Shannon, who will introduce our panelists. Hello, my name is Nicholas Shannon Zavard. My pronouns are they, them, and theirs. I'm a PhD candidate in the Department of Theater, Film, and Media Arts here at Ohio State. And I've been a theatrical solo performance artist, director, and educator. I'm also the curator for this festival. Um, I want to take a moment to recognize those who made this possible today. Big thank you to the Performance Studies Working Group, the, Gra the Graduate Theater Syndicate, and to the graduate students in the Women's and Gender Studies Department in their collective intersections for their ongoing support of this project. To the Theater Research Institute for hosting the panels today, to OSU's Arts and Humanities Small Grants for Graduate Student Research Program, and the Global Arts and Humanities Discovery Theme Programs for their additional funds that made it possible to make this a paid opportunity for all of the artists and also a free event for our audience. Thank you to my advisor, Beth Cattleman, who you just heard from, and over in the theater department, Andy Shelton and Rachel Barnes for their support in helping me navigate the grant application process. And finally, to Jenny Morrison, Master of Social Media Marketing and Assistant Stage Manager of the performances that I hope that you will come and see tomorrow. I'm going to throw a link to the tickets in the chat here. There you go. Before I introduce the panelists, I want to give you a bit of context as to how and why this festival came together. I met all of the artists that you're going to hear from this weekend through my dissertation research on contemporary transgender performance in the United States, which I began in all honesty to find the people like me the other trans people in and around the world of theater. I knew there was no way that I was the only one, even as I attended my first theater conference as a graduate student in 2017 and was told that I was brave for asking that the panel moderator use the correct pronouns for me. Even when I was sitting in so many rooms full of theater scholars, professors, teaching artists who were absolutely baffled about what to do with these trans and non-binary students who were all of a sudden appearing in their classrooms, or the ones who could hypothetically come into the classroom one day, but who, of course, had never been there before. As I began touring my solo shows on the Fringe Circuit in 2019, I was told by one artistic director I'm so glad you're here. It's been a long time since we've had someone like you here. Someone with biting wit, someone highly skilled at interactive performance, someone who makes straight white men deeply uncomfortable. This idea that trans people are a new phenomenon and a rare one at that, that I encountered in these theatrical contexts mirrors a larger cultural discourse that ethnographer Andre Calvacante calls the ideology of transgender impossibility. The ideology of transgender impossibility is this prevailing belief that transgender lives and ordinary lives, everyday lives, are mutually exclusive. Transgender people only exist in the public imagination as medical, psychological, or sexual oddities or victims of extreme violence. In the media, the narratives about transgender people focus almost exclusively on the details of medical transition, making spectacles of our bodies, and 
with rare exceptions in recent years, ignoring most other aspects of our lives or taking up any analysis of the larger structural and cultural forces that have kept our community invisible and marginalized. How this plays out in the world of theater and live performance in cis straight centered settings anyway, is that we can be trans or we can embody our other identities or, or we can have our work considered on its own terms. In the past five or six years, we've had a rapid increase in the visibility of the trans community in popular culture, with Time Magazine declaring that we'd reached the transgender tipping point of media visibility in 2014. They had Lover and Cox on the cover. It was a big deal. However, in my interviews with 19 trans artists working in theater and performance in the US, most artists reported that in their experience, this tipping point, it seemed, had either not reached the theater industry or it had, but in complex and not always so helpful ways. More visibility, it seems, may have led to a small increase in trans roles, but only narrowly defined, usually white, roles within a very narrow age range. It has led to more festival invitations, but often in a way that is tokenizing. For many of us, this increase in visibility, our participation in festivals and one-off events has not led to more work on mainstream stages. We are still rarely considered for roles that are not explicitly trans in professional performance settings. Some artists even reported that after coming out, they were suddenly only called upon to give trans inclusion workshops when they had previously done a significant amount of teaching artists work in playwriting, design, and other areas of theater entirely unrelated to their trans identities. With this increase in visibility, what this increase in visibility has led to is queer and trans artists being able to find one another more easily. Cis straight gatekeepers have, may not be inviting us into the theater and I have found are largely not ready to have conversations that extend beyond pronouns and bathroom access, but queer and trans artists have for decades been producing each other's work and creating spaces for ourselves. And that is what I aim to do with this festival. I want this to be a space where trans and gender nonconforming artists can come together and be in dialogue with one another in a public way about the innovative work that we are doing. In this space, I want to shift conversations, the conversations that we get to have from the near exclusive focus on our bodies and trans 101 sessions to the important and highly nuanced cultural work that trans and gender nonconforming artists are doing. For the cishet, croaks, cishet folks in our audience, thank you for joining us. If you do need more of a Trans 101 or vocabulary refresher, I will put some links in the chat for you to help you follow along a bit. These are um, educational resources that are put together by trans-led organizations that have the most up-to-date and accurate language and information that I've been able to find. And if that is not enough, continue to Google it. Too often we are asked to be trans or other aspects of our personal and professional identities. The name and spirit of this festival, Trans and, is a direct challenge to that imperative. We are gathered here as trans artists to be in dialogue with one another, to engage in in-depth conversations about the complexities of our work and its intersections with identity, community, and activism. And with that being said, I am so excited to introduce the artists for our first panel session, Trans and Intersectional. Joining us today, we have Siri Gurudev pronouns, they, them, or ella, si hablas espanol, a multidisciplinary artist from Bogota, Colombia, Muisca territory. Siri is a trans, pansexual, non-binary non writer, performance artist, and wounded healer. Their work orbits around the questioning and destabilization of gender binarism, visibilization of racialized gender violence, and the quest of how, being a mestiz X from the third world, can they connect with their ancestry while finding traces of queerness in the archive. 
Siri uses performance as an art form and a methodology for research. Their tactics include their version of disidentification, a concept coined by Jose Esteban Munoz, intervening reggaeton music and pop culture with humor and political strong, politically strong messages, and their version of fabulation, um, Sadia Hartman, Consuela Pabon, Donna Haraway. Imagining the past from a futuristic point of view, video art, visual art, and soundscapes are also a tool to explore their ideas and find ephemeral answers. With two majors, one in philosophy, one in literary studies, and a master's degree in creative writing, Siri is currently working on their doctorate degree in performance studies at the University of Texas at Austin. Siri will kick off our series of performances tomorrow at 2 p.m. Eastern time with a live performance of their piece, Carla and the Deconstructed Cabaret. You can follow Siri on Instagram and on their website. Throwing those links in the chat for you now. Next. We have Azure D. Osborne Lee, pronouns they, them, or he, him. Azure is a Black, queer, and trans Brooklyn-based writer from south of the Mason-Dixon. He holds an MA in advanced theater practice from the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama, as well as an MA in women's and gender studies, and a BA in English and Spanish from the University of Texas at Austin. Recipient of the Waterwell New Works Labs 2021 Commission, Kilroy's List 2020 Playwright, recipient of Parody Productions 2018 Annual Commission, winner of Downtown Urban Arts Festival's 2018 Best Play Award, and the 2015 Mario Freddy Fred Newman Political Play Contest. Azure's full length play, Crooked Parts, will be published in the forthcoming anthology of the Methuen Drama Book of Trans Plays. That book comes out in May and you can pre-order it. I will put a link to that in the chat as well. His full play, his full length play Mirrors received its world premiere produced by Parody Productions at Next Door at New York Theater Workshop last winter. Unfortunately, this production closed early on March 12, 2020 due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Tomorrow we'll be streaming selections from Azure's new play, The Crocus Eaters at seven o'clock Eastern time. You can follow Azure on their website, on Twitter. And check out that book when it comes out. And finally, we have Penny Sterling, pronouns she, her. Penny Sterling is a storyteller and comedian from Rochester, New York. She has written three shows, two TED Talks and a sermon. All of them are about her. Despite evidence to the contrary, Penny does not like to talk about herself, which is going to be the subject of one of her future shows. When Penny isn't talking, writing, or thinking about herself, she teaches public speaking and storytelling at St. John Fisher College, and in non-pandemic years, also does freelance sports television work. Penny lives with her two youngest children when they're not away at college, as well as her cat Benny, her, yeah, her cat Betty, who has so far shown no interest in higher education. I will add that Penny is also the host of a podcast called Transformation Thursday, which I've been a guest on, and which my wife Kate and I listen to religiously every week. Links to Penny's podcast and her website are in the chat now. And you can see excerpts from her one woman show, Schmilf Life, tomorrow at eight o'clock Eastern time. Okay, I'd like to kick off our conversation by asking the artists a bit of the basics of what we're going to see from them in this festival. So could you all tell us a little bit about the piece that you're presenting on Sunday and how it fits in with some of the broader themes and questions of your work overall. Let's see, we'll go in reverse order of how I introduced you. So Penny, Azure, and then Siri. Really, I'm starting? Yeah. Okay, okay ask that question again. I was really hoping to go to school on somebody. I mean, everybody else here is like, like these great <laughs> literary people with all these degrees and you know, 
I'm, I'm over here, you know, I'm out. So ask the question one more time, please. Could you, you talk a little bit about Schmilf life and okay. how it fits in with some of the broader themes of your work? Well, Schmilf life is about me trying to find an authentic relationship uh, as I began my transition. Um, unlike a lot of people that I've talked to in the, uh, in the transgender and non-binary world, I literally... I was so deeply closeted. I, my mom caught me in one of her dresses when I was 13 years old. And then on April 28th, 2014, I said, okay, so maybe I'm kind of sort of, maybe kind of sort of non-gender and like, but I, I've known my entire life that I was transgender, but I did nothing about it. I lived the straight cishet life. Uh, I was even homophobic and transphobic. Uh, so I had really, so when I started transitioning and I started uh, st searching for an authentic life, um, the first thing I, one of the first things that happened to me was all of a sudden I gained a whole bunch of interest from people simply because I was transgender. I was an itch that they wanted to scratch. Um, and so uh, it literally at one point, some, I, I literally had a conversation with a guy who called me a shemale who was like 22 years old. And then he also said he liked, he also liked MILFs, which are, you know, moms who I liked a friend on Facebook. So I realized that I was like a, a schmilf, um, which I'm not, but that was kind of like the, 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 the jumping off point. And so uh, I, I have, and I still do have a whole bunch of questions about myself, about my sexuality, about um, what I'm actually interested in uh, and I'm working through all of that. And this is like the first step in that, this, this play that I'm doing, I've, I've done. Um, it's probably the, the funniest thing I've, I've ever written. Um, a little bit the saddest as well, but um, yeah. And it's basically just me like taking the shit that happened to me and laughing about it. It seems to be a common theme. Among us Gosh, you artists. think? <laughs> um, Azure, could you tell us a bit about the crocus eaters? Sure. I was like, does that mean I talk now? What's what's happening? Um, yeah, I first of all just want to acknowledge the um, the great thing that is trans humor, right? Um, and uh, you know, in instances where I, as a trans person, or other trans people, have been produced by cis people or cisgender heterosexual people. One of my greatest joys is to troll them constantly. So <laughs> it's like the internet come to life. Uh, so yeah, I just want to celebrate that about trans folk. So my piece, The Crocus Eaters, um, is a full length play that is set um, on a farm south of the US Canadian border. Um, and so it's it's an all black town and it's a basically a bunch of people who have migrated, black people who have migrated from the south up to this town. Um, and so there's a young storyteller named Loam who lives with her auntie. Um, and then they start experiencing a drought, you know, um, and scarcity. So then they have to decide what they're gonna do about it. All right, so uh, this has been a really, exciting work for me to embark upon. I, as one of my friends described me, um, I'm a world builder. And so this work has been uh, a little bit prolonged, you know, because I, I feel like I created the world and now I'm trying to really get to know the story and the inhabitants of those worlds. So um, yeah, that's, that's what I'm doing. Oh, um, and what I'm presenting is the first 30 minutes of the Crocus Eaters. Very cool, very cool. Siri, tell us a bit about Carla and the Deconstructed Cabaret. Um, yeah, thank you everybody. I'm excited to hear about your work, um, Penny and Ashur. Um, Asher, sorry. <laughs> I, um, yeah, so this is, I'm more a performance art person, although I have participated in um, 
like scripted works, right? And I have written my own, but like my my jam is like performance art. <laughs> and in these times where you cannot perform anywhere, it's really tough because I feel like the place where you perform really detonates a lot of things. I have done a lot of like street you know, performance art. Um, and then here in Austin, I've been going to the bars, like the queer of color bars and stuff. So for me, like the audience feeds me a lot. So I was thinking, how can I continue that virtually? How can I create a cabaret experience from my freaking screen? <laughs> and so this was like the challenge that I put myself into. And, and that's why I wanted to perform live uh, for 30 minutes in this like short journey that I'm gonna offer tomorrow um and i think it's a yeah definitely a continuation of this um sort of like playing with popular and romantic songs and like criticize them in a way that is uh with humor and like uh you know like the good thing about cabaret is that you can relate to very old songs um from like you are singing them or you're like lip syncing but then your body tells a different story your body like it's like giving an opposite, maybe could be message that the song. So I grew up listening to these romantic songs that are a little bit not my generation. Like I feel like I'm a little bit of an old soul. And these romantic songs from like Bolero in Spanish, but also like what we call protest, protest music and like jazz too, are like incredibly sad incredibly codependent like all of the, the messages is like i'm no one without you my life is gone because you left me all of this and i grew up with that like a big ball of sadness of like oh this is love you know and of course my childhood trauma and everything was like make me a, a lot of uh codependent and so in my healing process i can laugh now about those messages it's like oh my god like i really was raised with these um, messages. And so the play, like the play, no, the, the performance that I'm offering is a little bit of a very gentle uh, reflection on those songs. But I usually do things that are like disturbing a little bit or like more like, you know, but here's, I decided to go so gentle. This is gonna be a very sweet, <laughs> uh, sometimes silly journey, but I wanted, because the times are so tough, I don't wanna be all like, you know. So I think I think I prepared something that is more like a treat for the audience and for me, and, and I'm really excited. Awesome. So something that I'm hearing coming up across the three of you, I'm going to take us in a different direction than the questions that I sent you, because I'm interested to know what you have to say. Um, I'm hearing this kind of theme of trans queer humor coming up in your work. Um, and that's not something that we get to see a whole lot of in like our pop culture narratives or in the media where trans folk stories are just often framed as like really tough and tragic. Um, so I wanna know in no particular order, how do you use like, humor and joy in your work and what role does that play? Joy is in everything that I do really. Uh, it just being able to exist uh, after um, 50 years of, of being in hiding. Uh, it's 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 amazing it's one of the and i still have a problem processing emotions and for me and i was just thinking about this today uh one of the reasons that i i, I love performing is because i'm required in, <laughs> to, to like actually emote the stuff that i have clinically written down uh and and, and feel it um uh, so that is really good the other thing that i do is i consciously um, try to make people, uh, cis people just a little bit uncomfortable. Um, that's, that's part of what I want to do. Uh, and, and I, and I can relate a lot to them having lived a, the, lived the cis life for as long as I did. Uh, I, I know which buttons to push and I have a pretty good idea of when to, to lay off. Uh, but, um, 
it, it's something that I, I, I really enjoy doing is making people just a little bit uncomfortable. Humor is uncomfortable. It is, it is finding the, it is finding something that is uncomfortable and turning it just enough that you can process it through laughter. So um, I guess that's my response to that question. Um, yeah, I would say almost everything I write is funny, you know, in its own way. Um, you know, it's sort of a mix of like dark and funny, um, which I feel like that like that's trans humor, <laughs> you know, like right there, you know. Um, so yeah, um, I mean, there's always going to be like some moment of levity. I think being a part of a community, you know, especially as a black trans person, you know, and a non-binary trans person, um, you know, our communities are just um, constantly under attack, you know, and like our friends and family are dying, you know, like at a very real rate at any point we might be called upon to like try to help save somebody's life or like come get someone, you know, it's, it's, everything's really dire. So, you know, in the same moment, like we find ways to laugh about it or ways to cope, you know? Um, yeah. That's what um, yeah, definitely. I use humor in my work, the scripted work and the performance art. I think my body is a great tool for humor. So what I can communicate with my body is like, um, it's really like, I love to explore that. And I think depending on the circumstance, I have gone to like more dark humor than when you laugh, you're like, it hurts. It's like, oh my goodness. Uh, and more like light humor that I try to like offer as a, as a way of like coming into this wave of emotions during a performance where you feel like a range of things, right? Um, but I feel humor is very complicated because who gets to laugh about what, you know? Like I always, wanna laugh like punching down but never you know like punching down is not good it's like i don't want to laugh about yet you know so it's just hard and i feel like it's this line where i'm like <laughs> i want i want to create community and and i have seen a lot of performance that uses humor in ways that like uses trans folk as like the the comedy part of it so that we can be denigrated and like you know and so it's like, oh my God, what is the line? And I, it's just like always like an experiment and a little bit of like an ethic uh, commitment to humor in a way that I feel is, you know, yeah. Nicholas, can I ask a question here? I, I, I'd like to ask a question. Yeah. Does anybody else here uh, deliberately front load their shows with comedy? Because that's kind of what I, I know that I do this. Whenever, I, whenever I'm writing something, especially if it's going to deal with something that's going to be really deep. Deep. I I will actually deliberately like look for humor to start out to uh, to to kind of loosen up uh, my 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 audience a bit. Uh, actually, I'll even go to open mics and like try some of the stuff to make sure that I get laughs out of it before I before I actually incorporate it into a show. And I was wondering if anybody else does that too. I guess just me then. No, I, I was gonna say, <laughs> uh, yeah, I do too. I think it's a little bit of a strategy strategy to communicate uh, something that is uh, what could be heard as a hard message. So you use that like lighten up. I I also use that. Yeah. And also to get them to like me more. You know, I I, I seriously, I I I I one of my I'm, I'm built like your dad and I dress like your mom is one of the lines that I use because. It's first off, it's true. Uh, and also just to acknowledge, uh, okay, I know who I am. I know what I look like. These are all things that I, and, and, I, and I address them in a way that is both humorous and not really all that self-deprecating. Uh, but so I, so I, okay, that's the elephant in the room. I'm the elephant in the room. Um, so uh, that's one of the things that I will do. And sometimes I wonder if I do it too much but it's still, I think, something that I that I at least now I'm, I've only been performing 
uh, like this since 2016. I don't really have a, I, I spent most of my time on the other side of the camera. So this is still stuff that I'm learning. I also front load all of my shows with a lot of humor, but this panel is not about me. <laughs> um, so I will hold off on that for now. Um, could you all um, talk a little bit about how does, in your work, transness inform how you explore other aspects of your identity or vice versa, how does other aspects of your identity inform how you're exploring gender in your work? Um, so I've been writing plays for longer than I've been out as trans. And I think that my transness really invited me to think deeply about the gender of my characters. Um, and whether, like, whether or not their gender was important to their role in the moment, right? So um, I've started doing things now in my latest work where um, I do give the pronouns of the characters, um, <laughs> but I'm also, <laughs> because my work is experimental and kind of speculative, there in my um, newest play, Red Rainbow, there are some collective identities. And so um, I just always make sure that I have a playwright's note to sort of explain what I mean. I've realized that I need to be as specific as possible uh, about what I mean because um, <laughs> sort of whoever, whoever is in charge, will, you just have to assume they'll do the opposite of what you want um, unless you specifically tell them what to do. Um, so unless you say like, this is, must be a trans person, they're gonna like try to do something else. Um, but yeah, things, uh, things like a collective entity, right? So explaining like the people who play this entity that is a collective entity can be of any gender, but they must understand that the collective entity itself is non-binary. So the, the, the pronouns of the collective entity are they, them, but I don't care what gender the actors are versus this is a non-binary character and I would like this character to be played by a non-binary person versus this is a cis character who can be played by whomever who <laughs> like fits the role. Um, and I will, I will say New Play Exchange has helped with that. The more that they have given options for casting and specificity in their website, it invites me to be more thoughtful about um, what I mean you know, and who's allowed to play what, and to just, again, just get as specific as possible. Um, yeah, similarly, when I write, I mean, my the first play that uh, was produced here in Austin um, was featuring a, on an entire uh, non-binary trans and gender non-conforming cast, and I I kind of want to write us in the place because I feel like, and I'm so happy ordering already the book that <laughs> that you all are gonna launch soon with like uh, plays that contain like trans characters because I feel like when you want to audition or something, there is not enough material to like bring in. So I really wanted to to do this play and like a friend of mine who is also trans directed it, and we wanted to make this like um, trans universe, right? Uh, for the audience and like the challenge of finding all those actors interested in the idea, the futuristic idea, and then training actors that are not uh, professionally trained and all this, like it was a whole journey of like what's going to happen with this baby play. Um, but more than that, I feel like my exploration of gender and feeling that I don't conform to um, a, a binary is reflected in my work in different ways. Like I usually do uh, different sorts of drag during my performance art. Like, um, so I would present myself in like different spectrums of the of the binary and you would see that tomorrow. Um, 
and that is just like my personal you know like experience on gender um but also i i kind of you know performance art usually is a lot of like autobiographical material sometimes it's not but like i want also to explore what it means for me to left my story behind for a moment and so i have had plays where um performance art pieces where i embody a family member of another person that i it's not my gender not my race no and and i have conversations with the people um just sort of like offering my body as a canvas for that moment and i feel that's part of the dragon or something spiritual dragon i don't know um that i explore within my own work yeah Uh, this one's going to be hard for me to answer because uh, so far 100% of my uh, of the stuff that I've written for the stage uh, features an older yet still strikingly vivacious white trans woman. Um, so it's kind of hard for me to 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 do this. And also, I'm I've written three plays, three shows, uh, and I, and I'm writing a fourth and. As we're talking about this, it feels like I've kind of like bisected because my first show was called Spy in the House of Men, a one woman show with balls, um, which was about me. And then the next one I wrote was called Parents and Children, Husbands and Wives, which is about my family. Uh, the next one, the one I'm going to be doing a bit of is called Schmilf Life, which again is about me as a transgender woman. And the one that I'm currently writing is called Children Are Designed to Be Raised by Idiots, which is about parenting. Uh, and that's really my two biggest things. I was a, I am a single parent. Uh, I have been a single parent for most of my adult life. And uh, that's like the, that's the thing that is, um, that is like the, my overriding feature, even more than my transness is that a fact that I'm a parent and I act very parental in a lot of ways. Um, and maybe it's because I've had almost no pushback from my from my family about the about my transitioning uh not from not really from any of them that I've, I've really not had felt the need to incorporate much my my daughter uh was a high school junior when I first told her that I was transgender and there was like uh, a, a 12 13 month period where we had issues but it was just because um I started transitioning. The way I wrote it was, I said, uh, it, it, there comes a time in every kid's life when the two most important things that a parent can be is stable and invisible to everyone in the world except for them. And I was neither of those things as I was transitioning to her. And once we got past that and reached an agreement with that, I've had absolutely no, and it wasn't the fact that she didn't love me or didn't accept me. She just was afraid of what was going to happen with her friends. You know, that peer group pressure. So I've really not had a, a, a difficult transition, really. Uh, so there, there's really not, been not much difference in my, in my life, in, in, my, in my family life after I've, I've transitioned, except for I spend more time in the bathroom now. I think those are also narratives that we don't get to hear a whole lot about, about transgender people's lives, like trans people as parents and our family dynamics, if it's not just either they're immediately accepting or immediately rejecting and then it's over. Um, so I think next question, I want to ask a little bit about um, what communities do you aim to speak to with your work and why those communities specifically? I mean, okay, so I am pretty clear that I am aiming to speak to Black, queer, and trans people. Um, like the, those people are part of the community. I am part of that community, right? Um, those people are part of me. And I feel like those are the kind of stories that I write most often. And everybody else is just lucky to be able to partake in those stories, right? Um, 
And I was really surprised when I shared my first like really specific story and found that like people who I didn't think would share an experience, you know, with me were identifying themselves in the work. I think that's part of the reason why people say to make your work very specific um, instead of general, because in, in specificity, people can identify like, hey, I know what that is. I have an idea what that is. Or even if they don't, it um, moves them to feel something. But uh, yeah, the, the same people who I am advocating for and fighting for, you know, in my everyday life, those are the people I'm, I'm making art for as well. Oh, and fat people. Yeah, um, body diversity is really important to me in my work. Um, and that I found that like, as I'm being produced more, this is a like <laughs> conversation that I have to have. And I'm starting to, I'm trying to figure out how to be specific about that in my, um, you know, playwrights notes or whatever. But it's like, the Hollywood treatment is completely unacceptable to me. This, this, that's wild, you know? So yeah, um, fat love interests, you know, fat ingenues, you know, fat people everywhere. <laughs> that's, you know. Um, I, I, I write for uh, privileged cishet white people, um, straight up. I mean, that's, that's, that's my background. That's where I came from. I was that for a very long time. The first time somebody called me privilege was in 1983. And um, I did not recognize it as a critique. I was like, well, yeah, I'm supposed to be. It didn't even dawn on me that this was, uh, this was something that I needed to work against. Uh, it, so uh, that's kind of who I, that's who I'm, I'm writing for. Uh, I, I, I'm kind of like trans 101 for them. I'm the kindergarten level of trans. I get them to laugh. I get them to play a little bit. I get them to relax. I get them to um, understand that I am uh, still just a human being like they are um, and open that door a crack. I'm, I'm very much into um, uh, most of what I do is feelings based. Um, and I believe that your feelings inform your attitude, your attitude informs your behavior and your behavior informs your choices. Most people's feelings about trans folk is fear and distrust. So if I can go up there and be kind of likable and goofy and still get them to feel and think about what my li what life is for transgender folk, I shift their attitude just a little bit and open that door up a little bit more because it takes a long time. I know this. It takes a long time to get um, cis het white people to realize they're assholes. Um, so, you know, I'm, it's like from one asshole to another, I'm telling you, you've got some work to do. Um, yeah, I have a little different approach maybe, um, or I don't know, I just feel like at some point I cannot control my audience because I perform like a and in the street or in a bar or, you know. And so what I think about mostly is about layers of access um, and like different access um, and like connections that I can do with different audiences. So uh, when I am surrounded by a lot of like uh, white trans friends, I feel like my immigrant, like immigration and colonialism sometimes is missed. Uh, like I, they don't understand a lot of the things I say or they're learning or, you know, when I speak Spanish or I sing in Spanish. So if you don't, you know, like it has different access of, um, and if you're cis and you're like, what is this person? So then you're having something out of my performance. And so I feel like it has layers. And of course, the most yummy, delicious layer I would offer is for like trans uh, people of color. Yeah. <laughs> and so they would get me and like, uh, you know, I feel like this camaraderie, but also responsibility to not re-traumatize us. And so I feel like there's also some of that in my work. Um, but I feel like other than children, maybe <laughs> it's like for all audiences, but everyone gets something different out of it. Yeah. I think that brings up an interesting question is what kinds of responses have you all gotten from different 
sections of your audience, like from audience members who closely share your identity versus those who don't versus people who are somewhat sharing some of your identities and not others. What's that experience been like in interacting with folks and their response to your work? Oh, well, they all can, love me. <laughs> if I can jump in. <laughs> I, I have like tiny bits of uh, memories of like um, one cis uh, white person that went to this play that I was telling you about. Um, I was like, well, yeah, you went there, blah, blah, blah. And, and he was like, oh, my biggest takeaway is that I don't know what those people are meaning they don't, that he doesn't know what do we have in between our legs you know the classic classic super classic and i was like oh that was that was everything you okay that was you <laughs> so i feel like that was such a basic um you know like course objectualizing like gays but also like i that person was like mm, i wonder like what is this this thing um and so it like I felt like, okay, you didn't, oh, whatever. But then other people, when I act, told me like, you're so brave, more people that talk like you should be on stage. And I'm like, you're talking about my accent and like what, my gender presentation or thank you. Um, you know, like all this brave thing that we're like, Ugh. and so those are like remarkable, bad <laughs> feedback that I have from audiences, but um, from some others, especially communities of color, they have told me that they feel seen in my work, like that when I portray experiences, they felt seen and they felt uh, joyful to be with me in the space. Um, and I feel like that is the, the thing that I want to stay with for sure. Um, they all love me. I'm sorry. I mean, that, that literally one of the one of the pitch lines I always do whenever I'm talking about it is everyone who sees me says everyone should see me, uh, because that's really what I get. I I work really hard at making people like me, uh, which was a character trait that I'm able to exploit as a performer. Um, and so, yeah, I don't really get a lot of. I, I don't get invited into minority spaces all that much. Um, uh, I don't get a lot of uh, marginalized people coming to see my shows. Uh, I don't know how to change that. Um, but yeah, I'm, I, they, yeah, the, 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 the trans folks who have seen my shows really enjoy them. Uh, and, but mostly it's the older cisgender, you know, my people, my tribe that, that really likes me, the older think they're liberal cisgender heterosexuals that that uh, that really find me adorable. Um, so, you know, I'll say that, you know, my show Mirrors last year that was up at Next Door at New York Theater Workshop was the first show that I that was really um, reviewed because mostly because of the venue. And so um, you know, there were a number of things happening. The production company that pr that produced it was largely white, um, but also because of the venue, I had people coming to see the show who didn't necessarily have a connection with me or my work. Um, they were just like, oh, it's there, so I'm going to see it. And one of the, <laughs> so of course I'm, I'm reading the reviews um, at home, as you do when you have a show up. Um, and I was having a lot of conflicted feelings because essentially what I was running into, um, Mirrors is a, this sort of, it's a death play, um, but it's also a black lesbian love triangle play. It's set in Mississippi in the 1960s. One of the members of the love triangle is dead, right? So um, that's what's going on. And essentially what I discovered is that, yeah, a lot of white people could not feel the pain of the characters, right? Um, and I feel like this is an extension of something that we know, which is that white people really struggle to feel the pain of black people and people of color. Um, you know, so <laughs> there were a lot of critiques about the play 
that were not about the play at all, you know, that I was just like, wow, can you, you like, you can't even see your like gap here, you know, your like knowledge gap or your empathetic gap. Um, and so it was really kind of bizarre because um, I loved being in the space, you know, and, and I create a really warm space in, you know, with my actors, performers, like I have people coming back again and again to do the work um, because of, you know, how it feels to be in the space. And so having that, but then the cognitive dissonance of like how people are receiving my work yeah, or at least online, right? Because like people in person are like, oh, this is great. And so I was just like, I don't really like, I don't know how to feel and then I was thinking, oh, maybe, maybe I just need to connect with my core audience. Like, that's what I really need to do. Because I ultimately, I don't know that I care what these like random white people on the internet think. Um, and we were just about to have our queer night. And that's the night like COVID hit. And they were like, show's canceled. And I was getting texts from all my like queer and trans friends that were like, well, no. <laughs> so yeah i mean it was a real reminder to me that like there's a reason why my target audience is my target audience and like the next time i have an encounter i really want to stay close to them because i think sometimes it's really toxic listening to people who are outside of that you know nicholas shannon if we have time there are there is a comment and a question in the q a that i can pass on um, or I know you probably have more questions. You also want to wrap up. So just wanted to put that out there. All right, fantastic. I will go to the question in the Q&A because um, I could continue talking to you all for hours, um, but we don't have that much time today. And I want to get to our audience questions. Okay, so Cole has a question for Penny. He says, I'm a trans man who did not come out until almost 30 and who in my adolescent years was incredibly also conservative minded. So I feel a kinship with your story. Does the length of time in which your gender was conscious was a conscious performance for you on the day to day inform what performing means to you today? Oh, without a doubt. Without a doubt that uh, I'm, I am, I am quite aware that uh, so much of my life was an act, or at the very least reactive, uh, which is why I called it Spy in the House of Men, because that's really what I felt like. I would go through these areas where I really didn't belong, and I would have to try and fit in. And so I would see guys do things, and I would imitate them, you know, and I would make sure that there was nothing about me that was even remotely feminine. And so the way that you, you did that is you, I think I was an asshole. Um, quite frankly. Um, yeah, and so even now I'm still trying to find the authenticity of myself in my day-to-day -day life. Um, and, and it is really, really hard for me to do it. It's very hard for me to, um, to, to figure out what it is that I want uh, as a woman, how I want to behave as a woman, who I'm looking for in a partner as a woman. Um, so yeah, it, 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 so much of what my life is like right now still feels performative and I'm constantly working against that. And I'm starting constantly work, working to take that out of my day-to-day -day life and just leave it for the stage. Uh, hopefully that'll, that, that answers the question for you. I hope that's most what you were looking for. Thanks. Thank you for the question. If other folks have questions, feel free to type those into the Q&A. Cole says it's great. Thank you. Well, we are waiting for a couple more questions to roll in. Um, See, Siri and Penny, I know both of you do quite a bit of autobiographical work. Um, could you talk a little bit about why you choose 
to work from your own life story rather than like picking up someone else's script. go um, fast. I'm, I think we're almost out of time, so I want to be short. Um, I think I struggle with the idea of giving people other, giving voice to other people. <laughs> I like it's the class, like it, this is the artistry of writing actually, but like to me, like I would be more comfortable writing a novel which I have done, not very good though, but I did it, uh, done a play where I feel like, <laughs> you know, I'm giving voice to other people. And so I feel like to me, and the tradition of performance art is so much, um, a part of it is so much autobiographical and that's where I like grew up artistically. So I feel like it was a little bit of, um, yeah, like I would feel, follow that path that was given. Uh, but I feel like in the specificity, as, as we were saying before, like, um, there is something reliable but when i feel like i'm a little like too general people cannot relate and when i speak from my heart and from my experience i can uh, do that better i feel like but i also have explored non-biographical work and it's just like i feel it's harder for me and i'm a leo so i'm like super narcissistic <laughs> like it's also working on it so but like let's be real it's like a leo thing as well so yeah You know, I just write from what I know and what I know is me. And I am just so freaking fascinating. Um, no, it's, it, it actually started out because uh, so many of my friends as I transitioned would ask me uh, questions. I, I was like, okay, I'm an open book. Ask me what you want to ask me and I'll, I'll do my best answer. And they're like, well, you should write a book. And I'm like, I don't want to write a book. And, you know, I have a, I, I have a, a history of doing stand-up comedy. I, I was actually voted the funniest man in Rochester, New York in 1992. Uh, something's changed since then. I'm no longer, no, I'm no longer in Rochester. Um, but no, so I just, uh, it, it is what I know. Uh, it, it did not, I did not, ex I did not expect to be a monologue. I did not expect to be a storyteller. It's just, I did a, I wrote, I wrote a show for a fringe festival about my life because all of my friends on Facebook were like, you should like tell people about this. And I just kept writing after that. And um, one nice thing about being 60 is that I've got a lot of material now. Um, and, and so I have actually considered exploring and writing other things. I was actually uh, approached by a theater company to, uh, write, uh, to, to write something about somebody else. And I'm looking forward to that. Uh, I've worked in news and I've done, I've done biographies and interviews and stories about other people. So I know how to do it. It's just, honestly, it's never occurred to me to do that uh, in this until just recently. So I, maybe, you know, intellectual laziness. I don't know. That's, that's the only answer I got. All right. We've got a question from Beth. Beth would like to know, um, if you all have any performer, playwright in particular, who has inspired you in your work. I won't ask you to pick just one. Any performer? Performer, playwright, artist, who are your inspirations? Um, you know, when I was in Austin, I was lucky enough to be there at the same time as Sharon Bridgeforth and Daniel Alexander Jones. And so I always have to um, shout them out because they really, <laughs> they really um, took me under their wing when I was just like running around doing like randomly anything um, when I was 19 or 20. And they were like, hey, come over here and do this work. So, um, you know, the theatrical jazz aesthetic, Omi Oshun, Olomo, you know, Jones, like that, that sort of work. Um, was really foundational and pivotal for me and my career. Um, and like my decision to move to New York City as well, because I was like, no. <laughs> so um, there's that. But, um, you know, I have a performer I work with a lot. Her name is Suzanne Darrell. Um, she has played the lead in Mirrors for, it's like since I started writing it. Um, I actually wrote part of it in her house. 
And I feel like, you know, the more people I meet in my community, the more inspired I am by them to, to be audacious and just write like really juicy, exciting things, um, you know, no holds barred. And just be like, hey guys, I wrote this crazy thing. Hope you know how to stage a hellhound because I don't. So, <laughs> yeah. And you'll get to see Suzanne tomorrow in uh, the Crocus Eaters. Oh yeah, I forgot about that. Yes, you will. Well, as an, an Austin baby right now, I also wanted to mention Sharon. And like in general, Algo, the space Algo has created, you know, for um, queers of color, I feel like it's just something that really changed me and like my feeling of what I can do. Um, and the work that Sharon does with spirituality and like the readings, the car readings and all of the, this daily, like sort of like felt to me like, uh, yeah, such an inspiration to work on, on my spiritual path in link with my my performance work and like, um, yeah, what Omi says and like what, you know, Alexis Pauline Gums is, is coming also from like Algo. And so for me, like they, they are like really important. Um, <laughs> but but also I feel like Jesus Valles is a person that I look up a lot. Um, and because I feel like references from like non-gender conforming Latinos, Latines, Latinx. Um, it's like, for me, like a, something I'm constantly looking for. And so I feel like Jesus is also like uh, someone I really admire and, and like, yeah, it's a reference for me too. That's where on the chat, all the names. <laughs> uh, I am horrible with names. So it had, I had to actually go and, and look up because I couldn't really remember what they were. Hannah Gadsby, uh, obviously, uh, has always been, uh, well, since, I, since I, I saw her first Netflix special, she, I, was just, I was just awestruck. Uh, the, way she was, um, the way she was leading the audience, the way she was manipulating the audience's emotions, the way she was teaching the audience as she was doing that. I do like that intellectual, that, that, that blend of intellectual and emotional. So um, uh, Hannah Gadsby, um, Ada Cheng. I don't know if you know that she goes by the renegade Ada Cheng. She, uh, I actually had a chance to to see her, her do a couple of shows. Um, fierce, fierce woman uh, who is also very, very cerebral. And she left a job teaching, I think, philosophy at the University of Chicago to go on and tour as a storyteller. And she's very good. And she also talks about herself. And she also talks about being uh, an immigrant minority lesbian uh, in, in America in a way that was both fascinating, educating, and heartbreaking. Um, Megan Gogarty, um, uh, who uh, did this show called Lady Macbeth and her pal Megan, um, was... It, is absolutely fantastic. Um, again, they're all the same. They're all, they're very, they take common themes. They do these really, um, you know, like the fact that, you know, she couldn't play Lady Macbeth because she was like this funny blonde lady. And, and so she was limited by that. She, she could only do these different things. And all, the idea about being limited as a woman in society, being stuck into a very specific sort of, of space, uh, again, spoke to me. So those are, free off the top that I can can think of. And the rest are just guys, so I don't really want to talk about them. All right, I think that I will wrap up there. Um, we've got our next panel coming up at 5.30. Um, until then, we will take a little break. Thank you so much to Penny, Siri, and Azure. Um, you all were wonderful to talk to. It was a fun conversation, and I'll definitely be looking up all of these people in the chat. I'm excited. Thank you. Bye. That was my yeehaw like, lasso. <laughs> <laughs> I like doing the snaps, even if you, even if you can't hear it, you see the snaps and that's a cool it. thing. All right.
Thank you so much. It was really fun. See you guys in an hour or so, half an hour. Theater of Dance at the Theater Research Institute. And um, I'm speaking to you today from the ancestral and contemporary territory of the Shawnee, Potawatomi, Delaware, Miami, Peoria, Seneca, Wyandotte, Ojibwe, and Cherokee peoples. In a moment, I will hand the discussion over to our second panel. And thank you so much to our amazing first panel. Um, but first, I wanted to quickly um, talk about the importance of preserving archives that reflect a broad range of identities and life experiences and discuss how the Jerome Lawrence and Robert E. Lee Theater Research Institute is working to do that. The core values of the Society of American Archivists states it well in their statements on um, in their statement of core values and specifically on diversity that archivists must embrace the importance of identifying, preserving, and working with communities to actively document those whose voices have been underrepresented or marginalized. My slide won't advance, there we go. Whoops, okay. It goes on to state, building collections that reflect the diversity of humanity is key to preserving a historical record that encompasses the stories of all peoples instead of just those who wield enough power and influence to ensure their lives are documented. And um, T at TRI, we, we agree with this statement in essence. Um, they've captured the need for archives to reflect not just the story of the dominant culture. Um, TRI aims to lead in developing diverse collections including through the creation of themed collections and thematic collection areas that are intended to increase diverse representation. So far, these include some of the items that Beth discussed earlier, such as the Performing Gender Collection and the LGBTQ plus theater materials. Um, it also includes the African American Theater Collection and the Yiddish Theater Collection. And as our collection development policy clarifies, uh, we are actively seeking to increase representation in our collections in areas such as Latinx theater, LGBTQ plus theater, again, fringe festivals and disability performance, um, as well as, um, uh, what else didn't I mention? Traditional dance um, plus, um, these are just a, a listing of some of the thematic areas that we're interested in. And to us, preservation is not just keeping materials locked away, but making them accessible to communities. We seek to build our relationships with diverse communities in order to make our collections visible and accessible to a broad audience. Um, one of the ways that we do that, that we love is events such as this one. And we are so grateful um, to everyone who's gathered here today and to our panelists and to Nicholas Shannon for their work on this festival. Um, if you have ideas for how we can expand our collections um, and rep better represent diverse identities, if you have ideas for community events, or you would like to find out more about our materials or making donations to of materials, please contact us, um, Beth Cattleman, curator of the TRI, or myself, the curator of dance. Here's our email. So now I won't, don't want to delay any longer. I'm going to go ahead and turn the event back over to our second panel and to Nicholas Shannon. Thank you. All right. Welcome back, everybody. Our second panel is trans and artist activist. So another theme that kept coming up over and over in the interviews I was conducting with trans artists for my dissertation was the link between their performance activism and advocacy. So all 19 of the artists who I spoke with, every single one, um, reported that they had taken on a role as an educator or advocate in addition to or as part of their artistic endeavors. So part of this is that there is this expectation from audiences that we educate them about trans issues and identity. So this is something that all of us are grappling with, either leaning in it to leaning into it directly or resisting that demand and everywhere along that spectrum. Um, 
resisting through encouraging audiences to learn from the human experience that we represent on stage in the same manner that they would do for any other playwright. In other words, listen to trans stories the way that you would and that you do to all the cishet white guys that get produced all the time. Another part of this phenomenon is that the link between performance and activism for trans folks is that being a visible trans person in the inherently public world of theater and performance is a radical act demanding to be seen and controlling how we want the audience to see us and interact with us is a revolutionary act when we live in a culture that is actively debating whether or not trans people should be allowed to exist in public turn on the news, see all of the bills running through state legislatures about this. Call your Congress people. Um, so furthermore, the history of trans performance is intrinsically tied up with feminist and queer politics and queer of color politics. The spaces that primarily produce trans work are community spaces. And contemporary trans performance is highly engaged in national politics, and we're creating counter publics which will support us and defying the legislation and cultural forces which seek to erase us and our communities. Something that I was struck by in my conversations with artists was how much their work on stage and in the public arena more generally had, had implications far beyond just the trans community. So these conversations were as much about racial and economic inequality, access and privilege as they were about advocating for people who identify as trans. We talked a lot about how issue about how trans issues cannot really be separated from our dialogues on race and racism, gender, class, disability. Many of us are finding ways in which we can use our platforms of performance to generate dialogue toward cultural change in an intersectional and liberatory way. Our next panel features two artists who have been per who have been in particularly interesting positions at the intersections of performance and activism, both in and far beyond the theater. Let me introduce you first to Rebecca Kling, whose pronouns are she and her. Rebecca Kling is an educator, community organizer, storyteller, and advocate for transgender rights. Rebecca began her career working as a touring educator and performance artist, exploring gender and identity through solo stage pieces and interactive workshops. Her genre bending productions, which incorporated conversational storytelling, personal narrative and comedic vignettes, took her all across the United States to interact with a wide variety of audiences. In 2013, Rebecca was recognized for her artistic work when she was named as part of the inaugural Trans 100, a list celebrating excellence in the transgender community. She has shared her work at dozens of festivals and conferences across the country, as well as with organizations ranging from the YMCA and Planned Parenthood to Comcast and various federal agencies. From 2016 through 2019, Rebecca worked with the National Center for Transgender Equality in Washington, D.C., serving as first serving as their community storytelling advocate before becoming the organization's education program director. She is currently part of the Beyond Coal campaign at the Sierra Club. Rebecca firmly believes that understanding combats bigotry and that everyone has the ability to push for a more just and equitable world. Rebecca will be performing a piece called Side Effects May Exclude live tomorrow at 6 p.m. Eastern time. You can follow Rebecca on Twitter and keep up with her work on her website. Dropping the links to those in the chat now. Our other panelist is Dylan Ruegas, pronouns he, him, or el, si hablas espanol. Current HowlRound Fellow and Latinx Theater Commons Steering Committee member Dylan Irregas is a queer trans mix Cohuitacan theater maker from Central Texas who holds a BFA in theater and a BA in Spanish from Texas State University. He is a company member for the Vortex Repertory Theater and has collaborated with Austin's Scottish Rite Theater, Capital T Theater, Generic Ensemble Company, Ground Floor Theater, the Indigenous Cultures Institute, and Teatro Vivo. Recently, he was part of Company One Theater's season 2021 Play Lab cohort. He also facilitates workshop, 
workshops for trans and gender expansive performers through a series of meditative and movement based exercises in order to illuminate the joyful and fulfilling potential that performance holds for those of us from these historically marginalized experiences. This work with collaborator Dr. Jess O'Rear has been seen at the University of Ox Texas at Austin and at the 2019 Transgender Spectrum Conference at Washington University in St. Louis. His solo performance, No Soy Aquí Ni De Allá, explores the intersection of his identities and reflects his navigation of the world not made for the fullness of his humanity. You can catch that at four o'clock Eastern time tomorrow. You can follow Dylan on his website, Instagram, and also check out his playwriting on the new play exchange. Links in the chat. All right. So to start off this panel discussion, I have a question for, um, I think we'll go Rebecca and then Dylan. So first off, how would you describe the relationship between your art and your advocacy and activism. Um, tell us a bit about how did you come into your roles as advocates, community organizers within the world of theater and then how did that stretch beyond? Thank you, it's great to be here and to virtually join. It was lovely being able to attend the last panel and, and glad to share some digital space with y'all. Um, I got into advocacy and activism very much as an extension of my art that I grew up at, um, at a theater in Evanston, Illinois, which is where I grew up, that was very much about storytelling and was about adapting existing texts to story and seeing how do we take language that we might be familiar with, whether it's from a fairy tale or a book or history and put that on stage. And as I was discovering my own identity as a trans person, as a, an adolescent and a young adult, that really naturally um, linked to the type of performance I had already been familiar with. So I was fortunate enough to have an opportunity to work with Tim Miller, who's a great gay performance artist out of LA. Then at a time when I was still, um, socially transitioned in some parts of my life, but not in other parts of my life. And very quickly learned that the way I was exploring my own identity on stage was also helping people in my audience understand what it can mean to be trans. I wouldn't pretend for a second to be able to speak for all trans folks, but being able to give one version of what being trans means. And I also pretty quickly realized that I enjoyed the talkback component. I enjoyed the education component and that as someone with a long list of privileges, I was comfortable putting on my educator hat and answering some of those questions and fielding topics or fielding conversations that would be very inappropriate if you ran into a trans person at Starbucks or if your coworker came out to you as trans, but that felt very linked to the performance work I was doing and the education work I was doing of um, exploring my own identity and, and you know joking that I got paid to do therapy and talk about myself on stage and people would get tickets for it. And that led really naturally to, okay, if I'm sharing my own story, how do I help uplift other people's voices? Ranging from um, initially just working that into my own material. So if I'm talking about my trans identity, how do I make sure to highlight folks who didn't have as much privilege as I did or weren't as um, at risk for discrimination as I am? And then as I started doing more touring and getting involved with some of these more advocacy organizations, how do I use that to uplift folks in a way that is explicitly advocacy. And that was a lot of the work I was doing at the National Center for Transgender Equality, where I was working with trans folks and with allies to really say, okay, how do we tell your story? And more importantly, how do you tell your story in a way that feels authentic, in a way that feels safe, and in a way that is gonna help move the needle for people who are confused about transgender identity and get some of the policy wins we need. Um, last thing I'll say about this is, is I, I really think about 
there's a, a balance, there's a seesaw or a teeter totter, where if we only have societal acceptance, but no legal protections, that's a problem. And if we only have legal protections, but no societal acceptance, then the lived experience still isn't there. And that what we need and what I hope my work has been able to contribute to in some small way is we need both the policy wins and the societal acceptance. And the type of art and the type of performance I do and the type of storytelling that I've helped others do, I really try to think through of that lens of both how do we move um, so that folks are more accepting on a one-on-one -on -one basis and more supportive of trans identity on a one-on-one -on -one basis and how do we turn that into political change so that we don't have to rely on people just being nice, we can also have policy and, and legal protections. Awesome, thank you, Rebecca. Um, yeah, I feel like I've un, uh, unseemingly or unknowingly just kind of like fallen into um, advocacy work. Just um, one of, of the basis of my, all of my intersecting identities, um, as as I, I do explore in some of my work. Like a lot of a lot of my identities that I do hold, um, I, I tend to be like in the room. I will have. Um, maybe one of them will tick the boxes, or maybe two of them will tick the boxes, uh, but not all of them will. Um, but then I also say that, and then I remember that I was in Girl Scouts for uh, 13 years. So that had a big um, influence on my upbringing of um, service to other people, um, service to uh, to anyone also who, who didn't look like me or who also held um, my backgrounds, my identities, anything like that. Uh, so th those were like kind of the beginnings. And then also like, uh, ironically enough, um, growing up in the church, um, my, uh, both my parents are Catholic and um, were very much involved in the church. And so they also instilled um, that, that idea and that notion of service and service to others um, within me. Um, I went a little bit further <laughs> than they probably like to um, uh, just by the, graciousness of being queer and trans um but I, it, yeah it was definitely a thing where i i saw the inequalities i saw um the fullness of the humanity of other people uh just talking one-on-one -on -one, just seeing them and not um not inherently seeing any like i guess like stereotypes or um like the the things that were like being imposed on me it was like no that is that is not like it was a, just a different mindset of seeing the world um and not accepting what um society was trying to impose um and so then all that i was as you know growing up of like okay well what the hell am i going to do with my life um because we apparently have to do something <laughs> with our lives in this capitalism yay thanks um <laughs> and so um i i you know love the arts and i'm I come from a, a line of, of storytellers, um, you know, just like familial stuff. Um, we, yeah, we're storytellers. And so I was like, okay, well, how can I, how can I use my storytelling abilities and my love of theater, my love of performance, my love of writing, how can I use that as a tool to be able to um, speak up and out for others who may not have the ability to do so, who may not have the resources that I do, um, who may not, who otherwise would be forgotten or um, just unheard of in, um, yeah, the, and so that 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 led me along to um, doing my pro own performance, doing my own writing, um, and then uh, right now led me to HowlRound Theater Commons, um, with which I'm the fellow right now for another whole month <laughs> actually about to leave so which is scary but i digress um and so how round um is for those of you who may not know is um an online platform for theater makers worldwide um they have an online journal of which people can contribute to um there is how round tv which uh, live streams different conferences performances uh, in, uh globally and um, there are podcasts, there are convenings, there's the National Playwright Residency Program. Uh, and so that, that's like a, an organization that is looking to um, servicing the, the greater theater field um, internationally and has, 
yeah, kind of also been able to to lead me in in more um, access and resources, and then able to distribute them um, as well. And that those are kind of like my leading lights of what I'm looking forward to now that my fellowship is coming to an end. Dylan, could you tell us a little bit more about what it is that you do at HowlRound? Um, what are you up to there, and how does that intersect with your advocacy work? Totally. Um, so my my day to day grind, um, I guess, would be just very very basic things of like formatting for the journal, um, doing the e's newsletters, social media. Um, in the before pandemic times, I would often uh, travel to do live streams um, at the different uh, conferences that would happen, like the National Performance Network, um, the Georgetown University's Global uh, Lab, um, tons and tons of different <laughs> um, conferences uh, that I've done. So it's uh, one of the big things of, of HowlRound is making those connections between um, theater makers worldwide. And um, yeah, so that that's like the, I have a fellowship, so I just say that it's like a glorified internship, but it also like has provided me so many different skills. Um, and yeah, I, so I, I definitely will uplift the the connection part of going to these convenings, going to conferences, um, and then really like digging into uh, the theater field that is, is, it exists now, or let's say pre-pandemic now in this weird kind of liminal time of like online performance is kind of a thing, but then also like in-person performance may never be a thing, but we're also doing storytelling anyway, because we are humans are in, inherent storytellers. So how do these things all kind of intersect with one another? Um, and yeah, just kind of like being a part, like being a part of HowlRound and helping steward all of those conversations. Rebecca, could you tell us a little bit about what you were doing at the National Center for Transgender Equity? Like what is sure. What was your job? What did that look like? Um, when I joined there in early 2016, I came on as the community storytelling advocate, which was a title that ultimately I developed with the, the staff there. And one of the things that we know from decades of polling, but that also intuitively makes sense to us, is that if you know someone from a population, you're less likely to discriminate against that population. And we know that um, whether it's around racism, whether it's around um, viewpoints on immigration and xenophobia, whether it's around religion, and um, Islamophobia or anti-Semitism. And it's also true within the LGBTQ community. If you know someone who's gay, you're less likely to be homophobic. If you know someone who's trans, you're more likely to support trans identity. And that at the same time, we know that um, much of the country doesn't think they know any out trans people. And, and this has shifted even in the, the five years since I joined NCTE, um, but especially five, 10, 15, 20 years ago, you would have single digit percentages of the country saying that they had ever met an out trans person. And you're not supposed to compare studies like this, so I'm gonna do some statistics cheating, um, but I think we're liberal arts majors, so it's fine. Uh, that depending on what studies you look at, more people thought they had met a ghost than a trans person. And that then brings into, well, what if it's a trans ghost? And then you get into all of that. Like it, it's a very complicated issue. And I, I hope that's what they're gonna really visit in the next Ghostbusters movie. Um, but we know that we don't have the capacity, we, the trans community, we, NCTE, we, um, even with allies, we don't have the capacity to meet every single person in the United States or around the world and say, hey, I'm trans, please be nice to me. That might be the most effective way, that one-on-one that -on -one in-person conversation. But in the absence of that, what NCTE was trying to do and what um, a number of, of organizations, not just them, but it, both in the LGBT movement and across the broader progressive space 
is, okay, how do we have people tell their own stories in a way that gets at some of that interpersonal connection, even if we can't have them actually going door to door. So a lot of the work that I did was with other transgender people and brainstorming, okay, how do I take my experience, how do, I, how do they take their experience of discrimination or of support, because we need those stories too, and turn that into something that I might write to a newspaper as a letter to the editor, or I might use as testimony at a city council hearing or at a state legislative hearing, or that I might share on a YouTube video or include in a letter that I'm writing to an elected official. So that when elected officials and when policymakers and when decision makers are making these decisions, they have to take into account trans people. I'll use a specific example. Uh, Betsy DeVos, the former secretary of education was an idiot and a jackass and um, was unqualified for the position on day one and was unqualified for the position when she finally left uh, last month. However, one of the things that I'm really proud we were able to do at the National Center for Transgender Equality is get some parents of trans young people and some trans youth into her office pretty early in 2017. So even though she continued to make awful, awful decisions and awful, awful policy things that really harmed transgender students, we know for a fact she had to do so having looked trans kids in the eye and having met their parents. And in that one particular case, she was still a jerk. You know, Betsy DeVos, I don't have a lot, I'm not holding my breath that she's gonna come around. But it was conversations like that. And, um, you know, as some of the anti-trans legislation has come up recently in South Dakota again, we know there are elected officials there who used to be voting against trans rights, who have since then met and talked with trans people and are now voting for trans rights. And we've seen that with marriage equality, we've seen that with trans rights. Um, and being able to use those storytelling skills and that performance material, because a lot of the stuff that we're talking about is ultimately performance. Testifying in front of a legislature, absolutely a type of scary performance. Talking to a city council hearing, absolutely a type of scary performance. And so we talked about not only what are the political things that we need to hit, so we need to hit that, you know, this study talks about the support for trans youth or this medical association talks about how important trans people are, but then also the performance stuff. Take a deep breath. What notes are you gonna have? Do you wanna rehearse with me? One of my favorite tips, and, and I know from looking at the attendees list, there's folks in the audience now who've heard me say this before. One of my favorite tips is to bring water because then you can always go, oh, that's a really good question. One second. Now, where were we? And that's my favorite way to buy time is to, to give yourself a drink of water. So in that way, a lot of the personal performance work and, and solo performance work that I did really turned around to then become uh, an instructor and a teacher and a facilitator of how do we help other people do the same? And, and um, something that I've always been very excited about is how do we move from I'm telling my own story to you can use the same tools to tell your story in a way that is that feels emotionally safe and in a way that you've thought about ahead of time so that you're picking and choosing what to share and when to share and how to share it. Awesome. Another question I had for both of you is how do you see your activism and advocacy work kind of working differently in different mediums? Um, so in kind of your workshop facilitating mode versus in your I am on stage performing mode versus writing, how does that look different in different spaces?
Ooh, that's a complicated one. Um, <laughs> because I feel like in some, I am some all ways, about asking the giant questions. I love it. I love it so much. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, because in some ways, like I feel it doesn't change um, because in my personal writing work, in my workshops, in um, the different organizations that I'm a part of, there's always a thought in the back of my mind of who's not here, uh, whose voice needs to be heard in this moment, and why, why is that voice not here? Um, yeah, and that comes in in different. I think the the biggest difference in in when that comes up is, do I hold those identities, or I'm just aware of those identities that I don't hold. Um, so that's that's the simple answer, <laughs> I guess, to that very complicated questions. Um, and I had another thought, but I've lost it, so I'll pass it on to Rebecca. <laughs> I'm sure you will find it again. Um, I, I would echo that I think, or I hope, that um, from a, a core sense of how do I want to make sure that this work is respectful and celebratory of everyone in the trans community, that I don't think does change. But what I think is going to change is for a personal piece, whether it's a written piece or a performance piece, I'm probably going to focus more on my story and, and using I statements and talking about what I've directly experienced and make sure to um, touch on some of those other things. So if I'm talking about my experience with, um, you know, I've been very fortunate that I've always been stably housed, that my parents and, and family never threatened to kick me out even after I came out to them, that in college that I was uh, stably housed. And since then, I've always been very fortunate that I've, I've never faced homelessness and, and never been at risk for being kicked out for being trans or kicked out for not being able to afford to stay somewhere. And if I'm telling my own story, I might just give a highlight of, as a reminder, that's not true for everyone in the trans community. If I'm doing an education piece or a workshop that's more explicitly political or explicitly educational, I'm gonna dig a little deeper into that on why that's the case and what the experience is like for trans folks who might face housing instability and the way that racism connects into that and all of the and classism connects into that and all of the different um, complicated and, and um, mixed up, not in the sense of um, confusing, but mixed up in the sense of all of it ties together and is a web that's very, very, very complex. And I'm gonna try and go into that a little more in depth so that I hope regardless of the work that I'm putting out into the world, it's still something I'm going to be able to stand behind and feel like represents who I am as a, as a political individual, represents my values and my beliefs, but that um, how much I sort of get into the lecture part of it or the, the um, facts and figures part of it, that the more artistic or performative I'm trying to be, the less I'm probably going to lean on that but hopefully that it's not gone entirely. Um, and I don't think there is anything wrong with, with you know, I, I think a lot about something that um, I know Jen Richards, who's an amazing performer and writer and, and trans advocate has said, is that we want enough stuff out there so that no one thing needs to speak for everyone. That hopefully there's gonna be enough trans material in the world that everyone can find themselves in it and it doesn't have to have every piece speaking to every person. In the meantime though, I hope that the work that I'm putting out in the world at least is mindful of that so that I don't unintentionally um, double down on some of the inequities or, or reinforce some of the privileges that I've had. But I think fundamentally, I completely agree with you, Dylan, that, that hopefully, my values are coming out in all of the work that I do, even if the way that shows up is gonna be different. 
Yeah, and that also reminds me of like allowing ourselves the grace of not holding ourselves up to like this high standard. Like I will also use an I statement right now, but like there are definitely times that I have messed up, that I have overstepped my bounds, that I have said something that has been internalized that I was like, oh, that was actually like really horrible to say. Maybe I shouldn't have done that. Um, and so, you know, that 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 is also like one big thing that I always hold in the back of my head is like, because that that's essentially like a, a what has been identified as a white supremacist value, right? Is perfectionism. So like making sure that we're not that I'm not holding myself to that perfectionist standard, uh, and not holding others to those perfectionist standards. That we all have our our learnings to do, our our room to grow, um, and and to change and evolve over time. Because um, I think that's also like one thing that you know we as trans people understand a little bit differently is the fluidity of things that like obviously like in the fluidity of of gender identity possibly of sexuality as well but then it, that can be approved or applied to all different aspects of our lives um so then it like depends like with the situations that you're in right like um there are definitely times where i have like slightly sidestepped my values just a little bit where i'm like yes we need to get this grant please tell them that I'm a trans person. Please tell them that I hold all these different identities so you can get that money, <laughs> you know? Uh, but it's, uh, it, but that's just like playing the game for what it's worth, like trying to, to find those different malleabilities um, within the, within the world that we do actively live in. Like, yes, we're trying to go through these, these higher ideals and, um, if we ever get there in my lifetime, I will be very surprised if we do. Um, but it's helping create those stepping stones and having those tools and resources for the next generation of people to be able to pick up and move on. Um, and then hopefully one of these days we can get to a more ideal and just uh, society. And like, meanwhile, we live in capitalism and like gotta pay for groceries. Exactly. An artist has to eat. I am not about to be a starving artist. That is not my trope. <laughs> All right. This is kind of coming up throughout what both of you have been talking about, but I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more directly to this. Um, how does intersectionality play a role in the work that you do? So thinking about all sorts of different ways that our racial, gender, sexual class, ability, identities interact with one another in the work that you do. As I touched on a little bit, I feel like the, the bare minimum is naming what identities I hold and what that means. So I am a able-bodied, college-educated, financially stable, financially housed, family supported, with health insurance, generally cis-passing, um, white-passing, um, like I'm sure neurotypical, uh, I'm sure there's a, a list of more that I could add, and all of those impact how I've moved through the world as a trans person. And even when I have experienced discrimination, all of those have impacted how dangerous that discrimination has been, both physically and, and quite literally dangerous, as well as emotionally and, and mentally dangerous. Um, so at the very least, I have a responsibility to make sure that I'm keeping all of that in mind. And that isn't to say that my hardships aren't hard or that my experiences of discrimination don't matter, but in trying to keep perspective and of, um, I, I think keeping perspective of making sure that when I am talking about being fired for a trans person, which no question sucked, 
and was illegal at the time, but still I wasn't able to pursue anything because it was what they said versus what I said. Um, that I also want to keep in mind, I had so many places to turn to when that happened, family, friends, coworkers who had my back. And that um, for lots of trans people, those safety nets weren't there. And so that when I'm talking about being fired for being a trans person, I want to, again, not undermine or say that that wasn't important or scary or um, shouldn't have happened, but to make sure that I'm not presenting it as the worst thing that has ever happened to a trans person in the history of transness, because that's not true. And when I'm thinking about how I am uplifting my voice and where and when I'm uplifting my voice, making sure that I'm also being mindful of where are the people who um, have not been able to have a platform in the way that I have or have not shared the privileges I have had so that, um, you know, when is it my time to step back or to be silent or to donate to someone else's organization or project rather than place myself as center stage? That, that what you all just said, <laughs> like, uh, because I do feel that like, it's like one of the things that at least in the beginning of my journey of trying to understand and like research, okay, what does privilege mean? What privileges do I hold? Like how, even with my, my own transition of like now being very cis assumed um, and stuff like how, how, like, how do these like, affect both my job, me talking to another person, walking down the street, you know, um, I also did a major move. I used to live in Central Texas. Now I live in Boston, like even a culture difference that way. Uh, and that that is actually like what it comes back to me is like, oh, they're all different cultures and like, or like, and like different ways to define culture. Um, and just because that is your one lived experience does not mean that it is like a hundred percent true um, or anything like that. And then moving into that understanding of, I'm trying to remember, but um, there, there's a specific, I, I wanna say it's a German word because it, German has fascinating words that they that they create but it's it's one of those things where it's like that that's um sudden realization that the other per the a stranger that you see like across the street or something like that um has a full lived life and experience um that you'll never get to know beyond just that one moment um and it's amazing um i think that's like really cool because i, I just like hold that wonder um in my head almost at all times, even when I'm like, you know, maybe trolling somebody on the internet for a little bit for being a homophobe or a transphobe or something. I'm just like, you know, they, they, they don't have this experience, but I'm just gonna like, ha like have fun about with this a little bit. Um, we, as as the, the other panelists taught about, or talked a little bit about, about like having fun with cis folks. Um, I'm rambling. I have a point. <laughs> it's Mercury in retrograde, that kind of happens. Um, I'm just gonna leave it there, we're good. One thing I would add about intersectionality and, and Dylan, feel free to jump back in, is also reminding myself, quite honestly, and reminding other people that being trans may not be the most important part of someone's life. And I think in the policy and advocacy world, we can sometimes get lost in legislation being the solution to everyone. But I've definitely heard trans people say like, I don't care if my insurance is allowed to discriminate against me because I can't get insurance or it's irrelevant whether or not my employer is legally allowed to discriminate against me because they're not accepting my applications in the first place. And that things like racism and classism and, and disability access and, and all of the other things that are important parts of the progressive movement for individual and even communities of trans people, those stuff that those other parts of their identity may be more important in a moment. And so not assuming that because being trans has been really critical and, and core to my identity, that that's the same experience for all trans people. 
Yeah, and also that just because they do hold in identities doesn't make them the experts um, within those identities either. Uh, I feel like a lot of the time, you know, I just like in different people, it was like, oh, like this trans person may not have like one thing with like, especially trans mass communities is like we can perpetuate misogyny really easily. Um, and you have there, there I've definitely met tra trans men who are like, you know, this is this is a medical thing that I have. And like, I am a dude all the way and they perpetuate the, the stereotypes and harmful parts of misogyny and sexism. Um, and so just to like say, like, just because the people have, ha yeah, has hold these identities doesn't ne necessarily make them the expert or, or have all the answers or even have the same um, ideals, thoughts, values, praxis that you do as well. Um, and that that changes across the board. Okay. I just thought gonna... I would jump in while we are about um, a little less than 15 minutes out and say that there's a few great questions in the Q&A um, yes. if you want to work those in. Will do. Thank you. All right. So I think First question from Javier Selfrescas, who you'll get to see tomorrow at three o'clock. Um, Javier's question is, what is a particular memory you have of a time that reminded you that your artistic journey is enough, that you didn't have to be perfect or speak to every story? I think we need that reminder a lot. <laughs> Yeah, I'm a Capricorn, um, so I am right and have to be perfect at everything. And I don't, I don't know. What you're, no, <laughs> but in in all seriousness, it's very hard. It is very, very hard to kind of like hold in that. Um, you know, we we there's kind of like a, a casual um, term being thrown around, but it does have deep meaning of imposter syndrome. But you know that second guessing of of yourself at all times. Um, and so specifically with, you know, the, I don't think I've ever f said my artistic journey is enough because it's very ongoing. It's still going to go. Um, and I guess the kind of like thinking in that like existential kind of way of like, it doesn't really matter. So just like do as much as you can with whatever feels good and what you feel is important. Um, and eventually it'll, it'll happen. Um, instead of like the very doom kind of thing of like, yeah, nothing matters, so why am I doing anything? It's just like flipping it on the other side of the coin and like, it's gonna be great. Nothing matters, just do it. It'll be fantastic. Um, so that that those are like a weird kind of way that my brain thinks about my artistic journey specifically. I think that's lovely. Um, I would say working with young people has helped um, I was a, a theater educator for a while, and I still work with um, Camp Aeronutic, which is a camp for trans and gender variant young people. And the level of um, anxiety and disclaimers of like, we didn't have enough time, we didn't have the resources, we didn't get off script, we didn't get our stuff together. And it's still being amazing and beautiful and fun to watch. And um, wondering, maybe, perhaps, that I also have some of those stresses and feel like there wasn't enough time where I didn't get everything together the way I wanted. And that I then hear feedback from people I trust that the finished product was better than I thought it was. Um, and that the people who are in the audience can't necessarily see the anxieties I had or the things that I cut or the lines that I skipped over. Um, and I'd say that that is a lesson that I have to learn and relearn over and over and over. Um, but that it has certainly helped when I know as, an, as a teacher or a camp counselor or an, an adult working with young people, I would give much more generosity than I might give myself. And so maybe, hmm, maybe I should give myself that generosity too. Maybe, we'll see. We have another question for Rebecca from my good friend, Aubrey. Um, 
Aubrey says, so much of what you're saying is really resonating. If there's time, could you speak more to how you encourage emotional safety when it comes to storytelling in your work? Hey, that's a, a super important question. Thank you, Aubrey, particularly if it's personal stuff. Um, there's lots that can come up. And I think the biggest piece of advice I would have is to practice because that's gonna help you first, just make it less scary. And second, to bring up the stuff that feels like it's too tender or too scary or too raw to touch on. And that whether it's in the shower or in the mirror or on the phone with a friend or um, it's currently 12 degrees in Chicago. So maybe not outside on a walk right now, but if it ever gets warmer outside on a walk to tell the story to yourself, tell it to friends you trust, to tell it to people in your life and use that as a way to get through some of those scary or icky parts. And then if there is a thing that you feel like is important to share, but that is still really scary, thinking about who's gonna have your back afterwards. Is there someone that you can text afterwards about how well it went? Is there someone that can go with you? Is there a pint of ice cream waiting at home that you're gonna treat yourself with? So what is the way to celebrate that you did something scary and hard? And then also what are the ways to practice and rehearse to try and make it at least less scary and hard? Um, and then finally, giving yourself permission to say, I'm not ready to tell this yet. And that that's okay and doesn't have to mean ever. Um, the first performance work that I did after I had bottom surgery, which is actually something I'm gonna talk a little bit tomorrow in my performance piece, um, I realized was too soon. It was maybe six months after I'd had surgery and I thought that I was emotionally ready to talk about all of this hard, scary stuff on stage and got to um, the No Theater in Cincinnati, which is a, a place that I really love and have a lot of fondness for and started to get the stuff up during tech rehearsal. And it was a lot harder and scarier than I thought it would be. And I hadn't given myself enough time and hadn't probably hadn't rehearsed enough and, and worked through some of those feelings. Um, and I was able to say, okay, I have to push through because I'm here for this weekend of performances, but then maybe I need to cut myself some slack and say, I'm actually not ready to talk about this on stage yet. And I need to see my therapist some more and do some workshops with friends and audience members that I trust some more and do some more writing of stuff that I might keep some and might throw some out. Um, but I think the, the biggest pieces about emotional safety for tough stuff would be practice and rehearse as much as you can. Think about how you're gonna celebrate afterwards and, and hopefully celebrate those victories. And if not celebrate that you did the scary thing anyway, and then give yourself permission to say, I'm actually not ready for this yet. Um, I would certainly be interested, Dylan, the, the, how do you think about sort of emotional safety and comfort when you're doing your work? Yeah, it's difficult. And it's, it's definitely from what I found out to be a test of how well you know yourself and how well you can listen to the different signs in your body and in your mind and how those how those translate outward. Uh, I think those are all amazing tips. Like I, I, I've done that definitely before. Um, and and I, I also kind of go back to my actor tips of like, you know, the ways that I was trained to separate myself from characters um, so that even though that they are my experiences, I can like still use those tools to separate myself. When I'm on stage, I'm actually playing a character. Whereas when I go home, it's me. Um, even though that I, I may be talking about, you know, obviously my own experiences. Um, yeah, and I remember one time playing a different character, being very excited that I could have a panic attack on stage and it didn't hurt me as a person um, using those different tools. And like, I would not have been able to do that role three years prior or something when I was like in the deep part of my, um, of my generalized anxiety disorder. Um, and so like that was, that was a big moment for me. And that was like using lots of therapy, doing all of that therapy work. Um, and then also like having those safety, safety stuff, safety nets for after the performances um, and repetition also, as you said, helps a lot. Uh, one of my big pro tips that I always use, no matter what my 
character is or if I'm doing stuff for myself or whatever, I take a shower when I get home. I, I, yeah, you just like go in, shower, and then like very much in a, um, like a meditative kind of way. I was like, okay, I am all of this like extra emotional stuff is being washed away from me and it is not me anymore. And this is who I am. Um, and there, I can always tell like the next day if I wasn't able to have my shower or like if I wasn't able to spend like as long as I wanted to, to get rid of all the stuff. So you can like, just like do very, very basic like body stuff. Um, and even like, you know, it, it, you know, it has a double a, a benefit of cleanliness. <laughs> Look, I've been on Zoom for 11 months. I haven't bathed in 10 months. You don't need to attack me like that. Well, you're looking great. <laughs> so, that's such a lie. I take so many bubble baths in the pandemic. It's just like so many bubble baths. Oh, that's fantastic. See, that's that's what it's all about. If you can, if you can do it, if you have the access to do it and treat yourself, you got to do it. <laughs> Dylan, I'm really curious about your movement workshops for gender expansive folks. What, what are those like? What do you do? Um, it's like a mini theater act in class where you just lay on the floor and breathe. <laughs> I, yeah, it's very, very much um, uh, using some bits of like meditation practices that I've that I've learned, um, and uh, yeah, it's 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 a bunch of breathing. Like literally, that's that's what it, a lot of it is. Um, but a lot of yeah, it, it it's therapy light, um, very active, and like just just kind of getting having a way to. Um, unify your head and your body, even if it's only temporary, even if you do like, you know, gender uh, as like trans, transgender and uh, gender non-conforming folks often do like uh, with our dysphorias or those of us that do have dysphorias, um, it's hard to be in our bodies and it's hard to like move these things. Um, and I, 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 even though I do these workshops, like I still experienced it a lot. Um, so it's, it's even it's like even if just for this one moment in this one like little workshop that we do um that you that you are unified in your head and your body for a minute like that's that's the, the essential goal of what um, i try and do with this um and then with my uh partner jesse um he dr o'rear as he now is um he hates that i call him that but he worked hard for that degree, so I'm calling him that. Um, <laughs> he and he does uh, so uh, very similarly to what you're doing, uh, Nicholas Shannon. Uh, of uh, trans solo performance uh, was a part of it, a big part of his dissertation. Um, so he did, he gives like a little bit of like this is who we are. This is the legacy that we come from um, as trans performers, um, and then we we wrap it up with a. Um, uh, like a movement-based exercise. Um, I've heard it called museums. I've heard it called sculpture, stuff like that, or gestures, um, you know, where we, we make um, weird movements and things based on feelings or based on like what we've talked about. Um, and within like, even if it's like a big panel of people, like just being like, hey, look, do a movement thing. You just created art. Congrats, you are now a performer. Go have fun in the world. <laughs> We are at 6.30, so I want to give a big thank you to all of our panelists for fantastic conversations. I had a lot of fun. Um, thank you to our sponsors for making this possible. I do want to direct your attention to tomorrow's performances. They are starting at 2 p.m. We've got an awesome lineup of performances of 
whole bunch of the people that you talked to today, making sure that's going to all of you and not just Rebecca. All right, so in the chat, I have the link to sign up for our performances. Um, and also, I would like to draw your attention to Javier's work. Javier was not able to join us today because they were busy organizing the Bay Area American Indian Two-Spirit Powwow, which is an annual event, uh, which was happening exactly simultaneously with our panels today, their major performances. But they have recorded them all. They'll be up on YouTube in the next couple of days. If you haven't gotten enough transgender non-conforming performance, by the end of this weekend, you can check out even more on Monday at the link in the panel, at, we're on the panel, at the link in the chat. <laughs> All right, thank you so much for coming everybody. Have a great night. Thanks y'all. Thank you for putting this together. Thanks all the panelists and thanks for, I hope to see folks tomorrow. Yeah, thank you all for coming. <laughs>